and um, I'm going to turn it over to you. Yeah, well, I'm, my name is Richard Pates. I'm a clinical psychologist by profession and a member of ISAGE, which is the International Society of Addiction Journal Editors, bit of a mouthful, or ISAGE. Um, and I am the editor of the Journal of Substance Use, and I've been that for about 20 years. Um, and one of the things that I enjoy is giving these, these presentations, because what we find when we get uh, papers coming into our journals, they're often not satisfactory, not from the terms of the quality of the paper, but the, a lot of the mistakes made. And I'm hoping that these sort of webinars can over, overcome those sort of things. Um, I'm very happy for it to be informal. Please call me Richard. Um, I'm happy for you to, to ask questions as you need to. And I, in one of the slides, a couple of slides on is my, my email address, and I'm happy for you to contact me uh, with regard to that or anything to ask. Okay. Back to you, Kim. Great. So um, the way I just want to briefly describe how we hope this whole process works. So today, um, Dr. Pates will do a presentation um, and, um, and then we were going to meet we haven't set a time. We thought we would do that towards the end, a time that works for everybody, uh, every couple weeks, right? That's what we said. Um, so, and, and during that time, there'll be a brief presentation, but also you'll be sharing your writing. So, um, so maybe the way to organize it is that is that every um, session, somebody's, you know, so there'll be somebody's paper to discuss, and you'll be re sharing um, your your drafts with each other, um, you know, with Dr. Pate, so, so that hopefully by the end of, I forget how long we said we we're going to do this, is it four months, three months? It's, well, we're looking at uh, between now and June, so it's up to six months. Six but, um, months, okay. So after six months, you'll have at least one really good paper ready for submission and maybe <laughs> more than one. Um, so that will be the process, and um, and you know it's it's really it, it's really flexible, and it's up to you as a group what what makes the most sense and works for you. But it really is designed to be an interactive process to help you improve um, a specific paper, paper, and then your writing in general. So I'm going to um, go ahead and give the cursor back to Dr. Pate so he can do his presentation and. Um, and remember, if you have questions, go ahead and and uh, and interrupt. Okay. Thank you, Kim. Um, in fact, it is only five months because, of course, January is almost finished. So, uh, <laughs> well, welcome to the webinar, and I hope it is uh, useful. Um, um, as I said, the, the important thing is that that you use me and the facilities we have here as much as you want. It is informal, and I'm very happy to. To, to make sure we're in touch. Now this, this opening session is about how to publish your addiction research and why it's important. Um, and it's really very much an introductory session. Um, now there is a book for the course and, and Kerry and I have had a lot of discussion about how you can get this. You can get it free from uh, iSage.net, www.iSage.net. But I think Kerry has also will have sent you a link to Ubiquity Press. Now, it is quite a long book, it's about 300 pages, so if you're downloading it, you may want to download it a bit at a time or the bits that you, you actually need. But it's a, very, it's a very useful book in the sense that it covers most of the areas in relatively straightforward language about you know, how you get your work published. And this is my email address. Um, Dr. Underscore Pates 23 at hotmail.com. Um, and I, th I think you'll all have a copy of these these slides which I sent to to Kerry. So if you so that should be on there already for you. Uh, and just want to, to acknowledge and thank um, a number of people from Ice Age who took part in some of the original slides from which these are taken, and I've adapted some of them because many of them were out of date. Okay, what we cover in this workshop is why your papers are important to science, how you choose a journal, 
get it right before you submit and that's one of the the, the, the things that as i mentioned uh, people don't think about before they do and, and some of it is very basic and very straightforward so it's understand the process of submitting and editing and the common problems with submissions what editors want for their journals and i think what you need to remember is that there are a lot of journals in the field now in the field of addiction there's probably a hundred journals there are um um I mean, my journal, I think last year had about 250 papers submitted. So there's a huge number of papers which we have to deal with. And, and so you are in competition with them, with a lot of other papers, a lot of other journals. Okay, so why are your papers important to science? What's the role of a scientific journal? And if you think about it, as, as uh, young scientists yourself, yourselves, uh, you use um, other people's literature in terms of the work that you are writing. So it provides a forum for communication among scientists. It, it, is, the, it is the material that we use. So no paper is ever entirely original. There's always a history behind it. Uh, it sets an intellectual standard in the field. It sets the, the, the idea of what needs to be done. Um, that's one of the important things about um, peer-reviewed journals because they are peer reviewed and it's not they're not just done um, as and when they can be done. Um, uh, they, they need to be uh, um, reviewed and, and the standard needs to be to be upheld. So it's the agenda for what to study. I mean, what are we talking about now? We're talking about all sorts of new things in the field and the field changes all the time. Um, and one of the things that I know that that I've seen over the years is the change of different drugs. I've been a, a psychologist in working in addiction for 30 plus years and I've seen a change. So the agenda changes over time and it's very much about new substances or prescribed opiates and all that sort of thing. Um, but I can remember when HIV came in, then it changed the whole you know, field of study. It provides an institutional memory of a field. So one of the things you can still do is you can go back to probably the 1880s, 1890s to the forerunner of the journal Addiction, which was called the Journal of Inebriety. And that's, that has very old papers in it, but, but all the papers that have been published remain published and that they are, they're a history of our, our, our field. Brings information to the public. Now, of course, the public, a lot of the public don't see uh, academic journals, but a lot of, um, of uh, newspaper and the, and the press generally will, will actually highlight important things that are published in, in journals. And importantly, it certifies that the author's work is authentic. Um, it, 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 because you've gone through a peer review process, we know that it is your work, it's authentic, and of course it advances your career. When, as an academic, you're looking to advance your career, one of the things you need on your CV is publications. By the way, if I'm talking too fast or unclearly, please let me know. So, large number of journals to choose from. There's over 100 peer-reviewed addiction journals. Um, many more disciplinary journals uh, publish addiction articles like psychology, uh, medical science, sociology, public health, epidemiology, policy, etc. So there's a huge number of journals you can choose from. One of the things is how do you get the choice to get your, your paper A, accepted and B, with the right audience? Questions to answer. National or international audience? Is your paper about your local, your country or your local area? In which case a local journal may be more important. Um, this, it is, I think it's, it is sometimes misleading though, because with some countries, the, some of the big journals which are based in, in the UK or America, sometimes disregard some of the, the issues coming out of, uh, of uh, other countries. So for example, um, I've done work in the Middle East, and they they've complained it's hard to get some of their papers published but there's a huge diaspora of people because of the problems in the middle east coming out so those papers are relevant to us 
language well language is an issue and and it is a big disadvantage to people who don't have english as their native language um one of the the factors that's come up with the the rise of the internet and the rise of um electronic publishing is link english is now the language is most most commonly used but if you want it to reach a specific audience then perhaps your own language is more important Disciplinary or addiction specialty journals, well, you, that's your choice, whether you want to go for a, say, psychology or medical journal or addiction specialty. Journals, content, area or culture. And one of the things you'll need to do is to go into that, uh, 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 the, the mission statement of the journal, see whether it covers what you've written. What the exposure opportunities are. Who's going to read it. What's the chance of acceptance? So the chance of acceptance can range from... 10% to 100%, so there's a huge range. Um, what about the impact factor? And I'll talk about the journal impact factor later, but it's something which is, is controversial, but um, is necessarily a factor. Uh, and practical matters, how long does it take to publish? And one of the things that we find is that people expect their paper to be published very quickly, but I'll go through the process of why that doesn't always happen. National or international audience, well, well, we've talked about that. Is it is part of a national audience? Clinicians, supposedly, it's specifically in your area, or is it national interest, or is it international interest? I think quite often, um, as I said, I think things, it's very easy to think that things are local, but quite often they do have an international um, bias. So read the mission statement, um, look at the content, and evaluate its editorial board. Who's on the editorial board? Uh, are they people that, that you uh, know and that are relevant to what you, you want to do. As a choice, sometimes you can publish in several languages. Um, there is the opportunity, for, um, if there is a language uh, journal in, in your own language, um, you can sometimes publish in that as well. So for example, a paper that I published several years ago was published with the original journal's permission in, an, in a Greek journal because they were looking for papers to start up a journal. For national audiences published in the language of the country, um, that's a fairly self-evident. Sometimes it's easier to get an addiction article published in an addiction journal. And one of the things that I've found is it's that, that um, non-addiction specialty journals sometimes don't understand uh, some of the issues in addiction um, and I think I think that's that's relevant because one of the things about all journal editors they will all be scientists who've also had uh, articles published articles rejected uh, all sorts of articles they try to get published so we are uh, as a group used to the, the processes of journals from the point of view of the person submitting uh, in some countries with those specialty journals other channels have to be considered, such as the National Disciplinary Journal. And in some, we know that in some countries they have their own, uh, perhaps one journal, perhaps a medical journal, and they want to, you might want to publish in that. Addiction scientists ben benefit from contact with other mother sciences because we all come from something. So I am a, I am a, a psychologist. Um, some editors might be doctors, sociologists. So we actually have a very wide range of um, disciplinary uh, contact. And some disciplinary journals have more prestige than specialty journals. So if you think about the journals with the greatest prestige, it's journals like uh, Nature, uh, Scientific American, the New England Journal of uh, Medicine, or that, that is a specialty journal, I suppose, but these have more prestige than, than, than specialty journals. If you're, not to sub, if you're not sure about where to submit, contact the editor. And one of the things that I always welcome is, is, is uh, contact from potential authors who will write to me and say, is this suitable? And I will always get back to them about that. Um, sometimes we have papers which are uh, not relevant. So for example, because my journal is called the Journal of Substance Use, People have have confused it for um, things about sort of physical materials or things, and I have to say no, that's not suitable for us. Or if a journal, if a paper is too biomedical, I might say, well, that's we're more of a psychosocial journal. So check with the editor first, and I'm sure they'll be very happy to talk to you. 
Consult the mission and state for topics, goals, policy and audience. Uh, every journal should have at the front a mission statement about what uh, they publish and what they expect. Get acquainted with the journal's format for articles, subject matter, methodological rigor, etc. Um, all of that should be in both the, the mission statement and instructions for authors. And see who's on the editorial board. Um, one of the things you may find is that in some um, journals, they are very much, uh, the editorial board is very much related to one country or one specialty. It's good if you've got an editorial board, which is fairly wide ranging in its international uh, content, but also for people from different disciplines. What's a journal's exposure? Does it reach your specific audience, uh, researchers, clinicians, basic scientists, policymakers? perhaps certain mem members of a certain professional society. Some professional societies, particularly such as nursing societies, have a stake in journals and, and um, th they are the ones that you are most likely to reach. How is the journal in important libraries? Well, that is perhaps less important now because of course, um, all of this is done uh, on online, all papers are published online, so therefore you don't expect to go into the library to find your papers. When I started my uh, psychology career at the university, we, if we wanted a paper, we had to go into the library, look in a book called Psychological Abstracts, go to the librarian and say, can you order this paper for me? And they'd order a physical copy. Now that is way in the past, so, so you, if you're based in the university, you can usually get contact uh, from, the, from the libraries. Um, print circulation, again, this is becoming less relevant because so much of it is now sold um, online. But among the English language journals, uh, uh, circulation varied between 250 and 25,000. Among non-English journals, 400 to 3,200. But most journals now survive on the papers they sell through researchers by computer and not through hard copy. So if my journal, which probably only has a circulation of two or three hundred of hard copies, they wouldn't survive, the publishers wouldn't, wouldn't uh, survive, or it wouldn't, the journal wouldn't survive if we, if we rely purely on hard copy. So it is very much about what, what is going on, on, print, on online. Abstracting and indexing services um, are record, recording the journal. So every journal is abstracted and indexed by a number of abstracting services, and those are usually listed in the front of the journal. And it's generally more, more important than uh, for English language journals. And the impact factor, which you will come to, is more only available, I believe, on English language journals. What do you Fifteen to 95%, the non-English languages uh, 25 to 100%. Uh, now, many journals don't know their acceptance rates or don't want to state them, but in, in uh, I think it's chapter three of the, of the book that I mentioned at the beginning, there is a list of, of, of mo many of the journals who are members of ISAGE and it should publish their acceptance rates. Um, Acceptance rates do vary, they, they do go up and down, but ours is probably about 60% at the moment. Acceptance depends on quality, style of the article, originality and administ administrative resources of the journal. Um, some journals may help you with text and language editing, but one of the things that uh, people, I think, forget is that many journals are run on a shoestring. So my journal is run by me as editor, my assistant editor, and uh, the support of an editorial board. And a lot of the, the business about dealing with the papers and everything is done by myself or a few people. And therefore, if there is a lot of work to be done on a paper, we actually have to send it back to be done. Consider the practical, uh, practical aspects. How long to get the paper peer reviewed? Now, this is difficult because um, if I get a paper in today, um, I will within 
two weeks, I will, I'll have a meeting weekly with my editorial assistant. We'll send all the papers out that we've received to two reviewers. Now, we ask for the paper to be reviewed within two months, but um, both of those people may decline or not respond. So we then have to find another two and they might not, may not respond. So it may be three or four months before we've even found a reviewer. Um, so that's one of the aspects of it. Um, it can be done very quickly. I mean, I have had a paper that was submitted in August last year, at the beginning of August. The reviewers got back to me straight away. We sent back for the revisions. The author got back to me straight away and we accepted it within the month. But that's very, very unusual. You may be looking at um, three, four, five, six months. How long between acceptance and publication? And don't forget the process is usually, it's very rare to get a paper accepted uh, on the first submission. It usually goes back for some revisions and then we'll come back. Now, <coughs> with my journal, once it's been accepted, it will be published online within about a fortnight, within about two weeks. And once it's been published online, it is published. And therefore you can quote it as a, 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 a one of your papers and it is can be quoted by people who want to write it. Now the, the hard copy may, may take weeks or months to appear because my journal, for example, is published six times a year. But my publishers in their wisdom have decided that they will publish in basically twice a year with, with two lots of three month, uh, uh, three, three issues in, in one, one, one journal. So uh, it may be a long time for it's published in hard copy. But once it is published online, it is published and you are a, a published author. Geographical distribution, i.e. penetration outside the US and Europe, well that's again less, less um, uh, relevant now because of course it is done online and that we can get that anywhere now. Special audiences, um, who wants to read this paper? Sometimes it may be a very, very a specialist paper for a specialist audience. I think um, that's one of the things that is considered when you actually uh, submit the paper. Um, you know, is it, is it a very specialist paper? Does it need, need to reach, reach a specialist audience? And that's why, so for example, if I have a very, a paper which is very much pharmacological, I have to consider whether it's interesting to my readers or whether it should go to a pharmacy journal. How much editorial support does it give? Well, when you have a paper that is submitted, when I have a paper that's submitted, it is reviewed, it has gone through not only for the content and the the ideas behind it the 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 um uh, research rigor the rigor of the, of the methodology but also things like the language um and that sort of thing and all of these things will be commented on and whereas if a paper has some minor uh, um problems with with grammar and things i can i can comment on all of those if it is too uh, if it is um it's too much work, it'll have to go back. And what I'll ask for is, is a thorough review of it. <coughs> Consider don't be fooled by the journal impact factor. Now the impact factor is something which has become um, relevant in, the, in recent years. It is um, a... a, a uh, an issue which is quite controversial because there, it is something which we feel is not necessarily um, an index of quality. High impact journals have more prestige, but the journal index factor depends on other things like the number of co-authors and indexing. And non-English journals are at a disadvantage. Uh, the number of databases indexing the journal will determine who sees the abstract of the, of the article. So when you want to see how many people will see it, it's often related to the number of databases that will be consulted. The journal impact factor is worked out by the average citation frequency for articles published in a journal, or how many times um, on average during the study year that articles appeared in two preceding years of that journal, receiving citations in other 
ISI, and that is the, the organization which, which uh, collects the, which works out the impact factor for index journals. And uh, as I say, this is, this is something which um, universities in the UK now are, and I think probably America, are asking their, their staff to make sure their, their papers are published in high impact factor journals. But uh, as I say, this is not necessarily a very good uh, metric to use. Um, just to go back to that, one of the problems is that you can, you can there, there was a research done by Robert West and a colleague, and they, they, they tried, compared uh, quality with the impact factor, and they found there was no correlation. So there's not necessarily, it is not necessarily a very good metric to use. The other thing you'll find is that some papers, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> some subjects like, um, like physical sciences are likely to have a much higher impact factor than, than addiction journals. The, in addiction journals, the highest one, I think, is the journal addiction, which has an impact factor of five. If you look at the journal nature, that has an impact factor of something like 70. So it's very hard to compare across different papers, sorry, different journals. The importance of diversity. Addiction is a field which is difficult to conduct research with the level of control one would wish because of practical and ethical constraints. And this is, this is a big issue in our field because um, sometimes people talk about doing things like random control trials and they're not ethical. And I can give you an example of that. When, when, um, when the HIV uh, epidemic started, we wanted in Wales, and I was arguing with the Welsh government about the need to start needle exchanges uh, because of the high levels of HIV amongst drug users, injecting drug users. And they said to me, well, we should perhaps compare one city with needle exchanges and won't put needle exchanges in another city. And I said, you can't do that. That is entirely unethical because it would mean depriving half of the population of a harm reduction measure. And that, that is true of many things. When you think of a, a random control trial, for example, um, what is the, the control uh, control condition? And it may not be, to, uh, or may not be uh, relevant to the, 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 the field. Leads to genuine disagreement about measures and research designs. <coughs> and because we are a multidisciplinary field, it will foster a disagreement about the importance of particular findings. So you may find in a paper written by doctors and psychologists that will come to different views about which things are important. wisely improve the quality of publishing by making all the journals compete for your best articles. And, and one of the things that I know is that some uh, journals have, um, although my journal, I have more papers than, than I can uh, I can publish. I, you know, I, I, as I said, I have 250 papers submitted a year. I can't possibly publish that number. So um, it is a question of competition. We want to talk about the stage of writing and submitting your paper. And this is actually about the, the nitty gritty of all the, 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 the details about how to get that paper done. The paper will only be as good as the content and the method you have chosen. And that's why it's really important to think and examine these before you start your research. I mean, one of the things that I always suggest to people is right at the beginning of the research is to think about writing an abstract of the paper that you will be writing for this paper now, even before the research is done now clearly you can't you can't go as far as the results or the the discussion because you don't have that but if you can put down what the paper is about and what the methodology is it helps concentrate the mind on on how well you can do that Remember to read the author's guidelines, which are on the website of page of every journal. And this is really important. And, it, and it's very frustrating when um, we receive papers which are perhaps the referencing style is wrong because each journal chooses to use either the Vancouver style or the APA style. And if it is the, the wrong style for the journal, which is stated in the journal, they'll send it back. Um, Sometimes we ask for all our papers to be double spaced, and if they are single spaced, they'll get sent back. 
if they are not anonymized, we'll send them back because obviously well, fast behind reviewing. We want that paper to go out anonymous to the, 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 um, the reviewers. And this will delay the process that if you get things like that wrong, you know, you'll, you'll delay it by having the, the paper submitted, sent back to you and start again. Um, and one of, my, one of my colleagues says, don't annoy the editor. And that, that's a joke, but it's actually quite important to get, get that right so that you can, uh, and it, it, it is very irritating to get a paper where, you know, the, the, you have to send it back, not because of the quality of the paper, but before you can even start looking at it, <coughs> they have to correct some of the, some of the uh, details. Qualitative research, a caution. And, and qualitative research is something that we can touch on perhaps in another session uh, later on during this series of webinars. But if your chosen journal published little part of research, special care is needed to prevent a rough ride from reviewers, even editors. Um, one of the things that um, I know is that some journals don't either don't publish quality research or have very um, uh, little experience of it or, or reviewers that, that, are, that are able to do it. <clears throat> and I've had experience of this myself, submitting work which is qualitative 10, 15 years ago, there was much less qualitative work and it was much less regarded in the field. And I think it's actually very important. Be sure that the very latest work on rigor in qualitative research is in your paper and solidly linked to your methods and analyses. One of the problems is that people with qualitative research sometimes think that there's very little um, <clears throat> methodology and that's not true. It is a distinct methodology and it needs to be followed. Uh, chapter six in the book on publishing addiction science is uh, <clears throat> on quality, qualitative research. And that will give you a very good insight on how to write about qualitative research in our field. Um, and, and if you're doing qualitative research, I would recommend that i mean just as an aside one of the things that when i did my doctorate about 20 years ago i um did a mixed methods i did qualitative and quantitative research and that was very much frowned upon by some people so it should be one or the other these days it's much more it's much more um accepted and to my mind that the qualitative research can sometimes give you insights that you cannot get from quantitative research is what the work what people are saying the lived experience of it <coughs> um, send a brief letter or email to the journal with the paper's title abstract and ask if it's of interest and that's a great thing to do send the abstract say is this of interest to your journal and um can we um <coughs> Uh, would you be interested in, in looking at it? And certainly, I would, any question comes like that, I would always look at it and um, I will always uh, respond to it. Ask any awkward questions, flexibility on the paper length. Now, in the, in the um, guidelines for authors, my, my journal will say we look for 3,000 words. Now, and that's excluding abstract and references and tables, etc. One of the problems is that all journals have a um, a page budget from the publisher. Um, and if I accept papers which are seven, eight thousand words, which I get sometimes, then it means that someone else won't get their paper published. But I am flexible and I um, accept that some papers, particularly qualitative research, may need to be longer than 3,000 words. So it's not, it's, not, um, <clears throat> it's not rigid, it is flexible, but you need to get the, the, um, the, the opinion from the, from the editor. Ask for typical times for the peer review process. It may influence your decision on where to submit your paper. <clears throat> and I say that that peer review process may be out of the editor's hands because it depends on how many times that um, the reviewers have decided they don't want to review the paper. Um, if you think about it, and there's over 100 peer-reviewed journals published, and they're publishing, I don't know, up to 200 papers a year, you can imagine how many reviewers in our field are needed. And therefore, um, we, reviewers do review papers for free. We don't, we don't pay them. 
So we're, we're very much dependent on them. If the response is favourable, you can begin writing. And, and I think it's good always, as I said, to write that abstract before you do your research. Uh, certainly when you've finished your research, do the abstract first because that clarifies your thinking. If the response is unfavourable, ask uh, colleagues for their advice or chapter three of Publishing Addiction Science, which lists descriptive information of many addiction journals. <coughs> So it, it's interesting that, that I know that from my own experience, sometimes I've um, submitted a paper to one journal and they've uh, rejected it. And another journal will be very happy to accept it. So, so there is very much about a culture within a journal, but also the editor's personal opinion. The importance <coughs> Too many researchers fail to make clear what's the original contribution of the paper. Such journals exist primarily to publish original knowledge. And one of the things that people um, make the mistake of doing is thinking that if I, if I um, uh, write a paper on a subject, then it will be published because it's of interest. But if it's already been, if that topic has already been published, then it needs, you have to really know, say, is there anything that this paper adds to the, the, the information? And one of the things that we find with, um, uh, comments from reviewers is that this paper adds nothing to the um, nothing to the scientific field. So make sure it's original. Make sure you tell people why it's original. So describe what's original about your analyses in your initial letter to the editor. It should be evident in the title, if possible, and the abstract. It should be also be described in the introduction and in the discussion and or conclusion. <clears throat> and things like the, just the title and the abstract are really important as we'll come to later because when those papers are abstracted <coughs> in abstracting services then those are the things that will be seen online and one of the things that's frustrating is if you use a title which doesn't reflect exactly what you've done it may not actually be come up very quickly in the abstracting services uh, here we are title Remember, the title is crucial for the dissemination of your paper. Uh, this is what will show up in the searches, so it needs to describe the research issue and the importance of the paper. Um, <clears throat> write in the same st uh, the title in the same style as other titles for the chosen journal. If unsure, read the table of contents for several issues to see what the current practice and style is. I mean, one of the things that most journals do on their website is to publish um, previous uh, tables of contents so you can actually see the sort of papers that have been published in those in the journal at that time. But the title is, is really important. I mean, one of the things that I find, and this is an example of why it's important, if I want to find reviewers for papers and, and they don't come up on my, my uh, the list of reviewers that I have, then I will do a search uh, online to see who's written on the same sort of subject. But quite often, only part of the title is relevant. So uh, it's very important to make sure that that, that title reflects exactly what you've done. <clears throat> Avoid trendy and cute titles. Sometimes people like to write, to think they're eye-catching. The problem is that your paper is going to be around forever. And, and you don't want to have a cute title, which is not going to be relevant in 20 years' time. Uh, and it can be embarrassing to have on your CV. Abstract. <clears throat> the sum, this summarizes how to how you carried out your research what you learned use if possible structured abstracts and this has become an established practice for many practice for many journals and makes it easier to write and understand and a structured abstract is where you have uh, <clears throat> title introduction it describes what the introduction is um, methods uh, results and discussion and it is much, it's some journals insist on it, but most use that style, and it's actually much more important. <clears throat> Mistakes to avoid, don't go beyond what you establish or pay. Don't quote non-significant non results. Speculation or telegraphic style, stay within the word count limit. Usually we ask for an abstract, which is no more than 200 words. And so within that 200 words, you've got to say exactly what your paper's about. And it is a good exercise because it makes you think very much about what you've done. 
The literature review <clears throat> has a, con uh, a conflicting goal of comprehensiveness and brevity, and it makes it quite difficult. Um, sometimes we find that um, <clears throat> literature review, <clears throat> sorry, literature reviews can be can be too long. They 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 include lots of relevance, a lot of material which is not relevant, um, and uh, sometimes they're too brief. So they don't make they don't actually introduce the subject adequately. The point about the literature review is that it says why the subject is important. And one of the things that I say, it goes from uh, a general a general point of research to the specific. So you may talk uh, if you're talking about injecting drug use, for example, you may talk about injecting, and you may at the end of the paper talk about say needle sharing or something like that so you go from the general to the specific <clears throat> again publishing addiction science uh, has um, a good good information on reviews make sure you include all the relevant citations for measures methods procedures and results um, if you were challenged to support why i chose this uh, method or statistic well, what what references i would choose to make that do not use too many references to support each point. One or two is sufficient. And sometimes I find that papers have, they make a point about something and they have four or five references for each one. And that, that's not relevant. You don't need that. So you just two or three or one or two is, is makes the point. And the last point is go from the general point of research to the specific. So at the end of the introduction, you have a refined research question. This is what you've been leading to from the beginning of the literature review. <coughs> method after reading this section another researcher should be able to duplicate your research with another sample ask a colleague whether she could do this with randomized control trials editors may refer you to a consort statement for high standards and your methods the consort statement you'll find online um but this is the point about the method. You should be able to, I should be able to pick up your method and actually do exactly. Mistakes to avoid any, if you think that there's any <coughs> suboptimal aspects of your methods, put it in the, the limitation section, deal with it there. Don't try to hide it or disguise poor methods. Experience of viewers will pounce. And we'll come across that in the limitations section, but don't try to hide anything that's not uh, good. <coughs> Results. Here you describe the outcome from your research. Verify original findings to be discussed later or included. Include all the findings, but without discussion of them at this point. <coughs> So make sure that all the research points are included uh, and, and that, that, that they're there, but don't make too over elaborate discussion. The results should really be about the, the, what the outcomes are for the research. Mistakes to avoid, don't overwrite, should be reported what you found, or don't underwrite, don't explain fully what you have, what you found, so don't, don't, don't uh, undersell it. <coughs> Do not report non-significant results. Do not say approaching significant or almost significant. And this is one of the big mistakes uh, people make, saying, well, these results are almost significant. If they're not significant, they're not significant. <coughs> and that is the point of using statistics to see whether your results are significant. And if they're not significant, they shouldn't be reported as such. Discussion. Describe the place your results hold within addiction science uh, as per the literature review. What policy issues does it hold? Um, what new issues did it raise poorly addressed by others? Um, cite the issues you include in the introduction, but do not include new literature, unless you're finding concerns expected. And that's, this is one of the problems I find quite frequently that um, people will start introducing new literature or new issues in a discussion, which is not linked to the findings that are confirmed. <coughs> so go back to your literature review. Are, are, have you found what you've, you've set out to find? If it is something entirely unexpected, then you can 
uh, of course, um, relate that to the to any new findings. Um, <clears throat> but your this is where your paper needs to explain the results thoroughly. Limit speculation. Uh, outline future research on one or two lines. Now, uh, it, it's tried to say that more research is needed, and that's what many papers end, but of course, more research is always needed. There's always, the, and no research topic is ever finished in a sense. <coughs> but it's also, it's some people don't um, discuss what possible um, future research is needed, uh, and uh, that, that can sometimes, um, limit the, the 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 efficacy of your paper so say that you know this is we found this this is important what we'd like to do is uh, something few, f further on this <coughs> and this has changed in the time that i've been writing papers and at one time we just had a discussion and that was the end <coughs> it's common to finish the paper with a brief section on conclusions so you reiterate the main findings and show how important they are for the topic you're researching. It's the opportunity to finish the paper by saying how important your research is. Limitations. <coughs> Briefly describe one aspect of your research. Most research has limitations, such as the population researched or the size of the sample. Don't apologize. But if you try to hide or avoid limitations, it will, will be picked up by the reviewers or the editor. So, for example, <coughs> um, sample size may be a, 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 a problem if you only manage to get a, a, a smaller sample size than you hope to get. And so you did then need to put that in context. Or I have had papers submitted which, uh, of which all of the parties were male or female. And you can't generalize that to the to the the world population. Uh, as I say, don't try to hide it. You need to be very very explicit in it. <coughs> Appendices, tables, and figures. Don't include too many figures or tables. And as I said before, the editor will have a page budget, and the reader will not want to go through endless figures or tables. Only include those that are important for the understanding of the paper. A maximum of five should be sufficient. And sometimes I do get an inordinate number of, of uh, it's like 10, 10 tables, 10 uh, figures. And for the reader, you know, just think of yourself as a reader, you don't want to go through all of those. And there should be five of each, a maximum of five of each should be the, the, the important number. And given that we have, you know, these page budgets, Editors will be very pleased if you have a, a very concise paper. <coughs> Conciseness is very important. Check with the editor about appendices, number, length, discussion, and for the text. Uh, mistakes to avoid. It's e easy to include too many pages of appendices. This is not so important, but it's only to be published online. If it's only to be published online, it, it's, um, <coughs> it's not so important. It's important for hard copy versions. Sorry, I gabbled that. One of the things about appendices is that if you are going to publish online, that doesn't matter. Space doesn't matter. And I had a paper recently that had 70 pages of supplementary materials. And what I had to say to the author is, we can't publish this in hard copy, but we can publish it online. So if you want to, to have a lot of appendices, tables things think about what is really important and those that uh, aren't so important you can have published online <coughs> um, and, and that is important because as i say we won't publish a, a lot of stuff and one of the things as a an editor is i read all these papers i read them right through and i also don't want to go through a huge number of um appendices which are not necessarily relevant references the reference list is to allow any reader to retrace all of the evidence you cite. It must therefore be complete and accurate. And one of the things that we find is that sometimes there are papers cited in the text which are not in the reference list, or conversely, they're in the reference list that are not cited in the text. 
So the two should should be um, uh, to match. They should be complete and accurate. And in the text, it should be just the surname of the authors uh, for the APA or Harvard style. And for that, I ask people just the first two authors plus et al and the date. So it would be Jones and Smith et al and the date. Um, if it's the Vancouver style, then the number of the references as appears in the, in the paper. Sorry, there's a mis bloody mistake there. Listed in numerical order in the reference list. So the Vancouver style, in the paper, you'd put a number where the reference appears, and then it would be numerical style in the, in the, uh, in the reference list. If the reference list is in the APA style, then it should be in alphabetical order from the surname of the first author, in the Vancouver style, it should be the author, the order in which they appear in the text. The references should not be, uh, should be full, and not two authors plus et al, unless there's a very large number of authors for the papers cited. And this is a problem sometimes with some papers. Um, if you have a paper written on genetics, they sometimes have 20 or 30 authors, if it's a big study, and they can be immensely complex. Um, but usually I ask for all authors to be listed. And there's a danger that sometimes they will just, <coughs> for brevity, put the first couple of authors in and then put some dots in and et al. Uh, if it's possible, unless there's a very large number of authors, just make sure they're, they're all in. If foreign language titles require translation, verify if they do. Uh, translate them in the first copy sent to the author, uh, editor. Sometimes I get papers with... with um, foreign language titles, which if I don't speak that language, don't mean anything to me. So it is useful to have the um, uh, uh, translation uh, in the first copy sent to the editor. And don't forget, these references are very important because that retraces the work that you've done. Feedback before submission. And this is really important. <clears throat> uh, even though I'm a fairly experienced uh, author and I've published a large number of papers. I always ask other people to read the paper before I submit it. Um, experienced authors and researchers can make mistakes because they fail to see on rereading the paper because of familiarity. So you've, re you've written this paper, you've probably changed it several times, you've changed it, you've checked it, and because these days we do it on, uh, on, on, a, um, on a computer, we, we, we don't have the original copy to go back to. We've often just changed it and edited it. And we sometimes miss things. <coughs> Other people seeing it fresh, you will pick up the mistakes than the non sequiturs. So really ask someone else to do it because it makes a huge difference. It's much better that your friend, your partner, uh, colleague at work will pick up these mistakes before um, the editor does. Process of submitting. <coughs> Journals have a duty to avoid wasting referee time and undue delays in responding to authors. And this is two things that I've said, that we have a great shortage of referees and therefore I don't want to waste their time. And if I waste their time, they may say in future, well, I don't want to review for you. Similarly, you as authors, you, it's not fair that we have undue delays to you. So the final decision uh, um, of, of the uh, editor will be based on these number of, of um, issues. Certainly the most important is the importance or originality of your work. And um, it's, it's important to say that, that all of your research will have some originality, but you need, you need to highlight that. You're not just repeating someone else's work, you're doing something new. You're actually creating something special. <clears throat> what are the reviewers' concerns? Um, now, one of the big, the big problems for me as an editor is that sometimes I get two reviews back and one will say, accept this paper, another will say, reject it. Now, those are two extremes, but quite often the, it, it's about the number of concerns that the reviewers have. Um, and you need to read these carefully because um, sometimes they may be over pedantic, but quite often they they are very relevant. Sometimes there are fatal flaws in the in the the, the paper, 
it may be a flaw in the methodology, uh, which means that, that it actually renders the the <coughs> the paper um, unacceptable. What's the journal philosophy? What's the the, the subject matter? So as I've said already, if I find a paper or is very pharmacological, I would say. Um, no, this is maybe a good paper, but I would suggest you submit it to a different journal because um, this doesn't really come within our um, with our sphere of publication. We are a psychosocial journal. What space is available? Well, I would ex I will look at all papers on the basis of um, that, that everyone deserves to be a chance of being published, but there is that limited space. So certainly, we've already spoken about length. Um, and certainly, if the paper is not making a major inter or, or uh, an original contribution, then that will that will be affected by the space available. You will find some journals which are not peer reviewed uh, or magazines will, will take things which have much less originality. But I do get papers which are um, I had a paper recently submitted which was about the, the, the fact that, that amphetamine can cause psychosis in people. Well. We know that we've known that for years, so that's not an original subject. How much editorial work is required? Well, um, that's a difficult one because um, it's my job as editor to write back to you to say what needs to be done. Um, what I can't do is I can't do the <clears throat> the the editing of the work if it is too much. So, for example, I um, have sometimes have had papers where. The language is so poor that I don't understand the paper and I have to write back and say uh, I'm having to reject this but if you get this paper edited by a native English speaker or someone with a far better command of English then we will reconsider it <coughs> so um, th those sort of things are all important <laughs> It will be um, seen by the editor or maybe an associate editor. <coughs> and um, it may be rejected for one of these reasons. Outside the scope of the journal, but as I mentioned, if it's if for my journal, if it's too biomedical, if it is too uh, pharmacological, then um, it would, would be probably rejected on that basis. But it would be rejected on the basis that I would suggest you, you go to a different <clears throat> different journal. Uh, sometimes, as I say, there are there are papers which have nothing to do with addiction or anything, and then I just say we, we can't accept that. Um, the manuscript type is unacceptable. Now, uh, my journal will accept um, reviews and original research and case studies and letters. I'll, I'll accept uh, well, I, I will uh, accept anything subject to review. <clears throat> Some journals, however, will only publish. Uh, original research and and so you need to check that that, that does that ignores instructions to authors if you there are long instructions for authors and if you ignore them all uh the paper may be rejected and and um usually that 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 is a reason that i would go back to them with them with the major things saying before i can review this paper please um get the references right please double space it please um, anonymize it, etc. Take the tables out. I mean, a, a paper should be um, one should include a paper which is the abstract, the paper itself, and the references. <coughs> Secondly, the tables and the um, tables and figures should be on a separate file, and the author's details should be on a, a, another separate file. So that these can be, uh, the, we can send the paper out anonymously to the to the uh, reviewers. If there are major methodological weaknesses, for example, two few subjects, then we may clearly uh, not accept those. Clear ethical problems. Um, ethical issues are a big issue in 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 um, in all scientific research, and there are certainly things that that now would not be published which would have been published 40 years ago when i was a, a baby psychologist learning psychology <clears throat> there were some fascinating studies from america on social psychology which would never be published now because they weren't ethical and that would see it certainly include 
uh, that is true of our, our field as well. So as a, the example I gave earlier about needle exchange in one city and not in another is a clear ethical problem. If it is purely descriptive, parochial, no hypotheses, no conclusions, and you may be surprised but people do submit papers like that, then quite clearly uh, that, that is not acceptable. No statistical analysis. Um, you can't make conclusions of things if there is no statistical analysis in it um, or if there's nothing new in it. If the, if the paper is just a repetition of someone else's work, then we would have to reject that. There's nothing new in it. Um, the other thing that we, we do sometimes get, and this is a, a new thing, um, people are presenting papers which are uh, proposals that they are they're, they're writing the paper but without the um uh, the results or conclusions but they write it so this is what we're going to do and, and there is an increased interest in this although because of space we have to be very careful about you know how many of these we will publish so. richard this is kim can i ask a question um of course you can <laughs> so one of the one of the sort of issues in the field is the, the concern about replicability of studies and um, you know when you talk about nothing new what's your what's your attitude or what's Ice Age is um, attitude about um, replication studies and publishing um, articles on you know basically we we you know the science there's already been papers on this particular issue but we replicated the research and we found da da da, da. well th th that's fine they have some different findings I <clears throat> I, well let, let, let me let me be more cl more clear i think i think th that you're right in that one of the problems is that <clears throat> if you just replicated the paper and there was no new findings then that wouldn't be anything new however Papers are quite often replicated with perhaps a different population or with a different, uh, uh, be a, a, another slightly different aspect to it. Um, and, and those are always acceptable. If it is exactly the same, then I think it'd be very hard to get it published. But I think one of the interesting things is that, that and you'll find this when you look at meta reviews, is that, that, that quite often the effect strength of the, uh, that is found in the first paper is diminished as people tend to replicate it <clears throat> but i think it is important because i mean one of the major flaws in science i think and this is a bit outside of this but but it is that people are very unwilling to to submit their papers where they have not found significant results or found negative results and to my mind these are equally important so if you look at your the question you asked if you <clears throat> replicated a study and your results were completely different from the original study i.e you didn't find anything original or you did sorry you didn't find anything significant then i think this is worth reporting because i think that is the basis of a debate in the field and it's very easy to say uh that, that once the paper's been published and that's fine um i mean we know from from uh from the history of science and even the history of addiction that, that certain things that were published in the past are no longer true um, <clears throat> and they have been challenged um, and we know that sometimes there is for example um, people have published very wild accusations and, and the thing that I always think about is the thing published by Andrew Wakefield about the link between MMR and autism, uh, <clears throat> the MMR vaccination and autism. And that has done huge damage because that link has never been proven. And what that has meant is that a lot of children that in, in, in countries like Britain and America, there's a lot of children that are not being vaccinated and are now suffering quite severe problems with some of these childhood diseases. So sorry, I'm going off the subject a bit, but but you're you're right, uh, um, Kim, that that if there's nothing new and you find it exactly the same then it's hard to get it published however if you find something different or conversely if you find that you don't have any significant results then that is an interesting thing to report 
maybe that your methodology was different maybe your uh, population was different but that in itself is relevant you know does this only occur in this population um or whatever so i think i think that um you have to be you have to think about that before you when you first design the study is there going to be anything different about this is that helpful right okay um <clears throat> compile it with details of structure authors indicate the problem that is addressed at the outset what is this paper about ensure the introduction summarizes previous work adequately and as i said go from the general to the specific set the objectives of the work one of the things that i always say to people is at the end of the of the introduction you should have a have the aims this is what this is about or maybe a separate aims uh, section but this is this is what this uh, this this uh, study is about doing something that has not been done before is not enough why does it need to be done why do we need to, to test this hypothesis <clears throat> state the hypothesis to be tested how will they be tested and outline the plan of the work don't include conclusions in the introduction may seem obvious but you'll be surprised at what we see that people have methods convince the reader that the methods are valid study the methods section of recently published papers and use similar techniques so uh, the, the whole point about methods is that i should be able to um, replicate it with a population locally recruitment procedures how did i recruit my my subjects where did i recruit them from what are the inclusion and exclusion criteria one of the interesting things about inclusion and exclusion criteria is that if you work in a clinical setting and you try to do research you may find that the exclusion criteria are so um rigid that they actually have a different produce a different population than you see in your clinic so if for example um, years ago, I did some research on uh, substituting um, dexamphetamine for people with amphetamine problems. The exclusion criteria had to include things like mental health problems, pregnancy, uh, BMI, and all sorts of things. But this weren't necessarily the population that I was seeing. So be very careful about your exclusion criteria because you may find that, that actually it, it limits what the, the conclusions that you can come from come to. Reference previous use of measuring instruments and techniques. Why have you used these techniques? Who else has used them in the past? Don't just say what you did, explain why you did it that way. How are the drug doses chosen, for example? Why you chose this method rather than that method? Include as much data as possible in the space and specify statistical methods and the software used. Remember, this has to be replicated. Common problems with results sections are mixed with um, descriptions of methods and conclusions that are not related to the questions asked. So sometimes, as I said, when we talked about results earlier, they have to be a very concise thing of what the results are. Uh, we don't want methods in there. Those should be in the method section. We don't want the conclusions in there. Claims are made, but the data are not shown. Sometimes people will make claims for which the data is not the data is not described just the results of the statistical analysis so you can't just state the statistical analysis with, without describing the data boring to read because the important findings are left to the end and not emphasized enough i mean i like to see results sections which are concise they state the the results in in the in the order of the um hypothesis you've made and they are concise insufficient graphical rep gra graphical representation try to make the figures understandable without reading the text graphical representation should be quite when you say see figure one it should be quite clear what that figure means <coughs> excessive details in tables and figures obscures the message and waste space do not duplicate so don't write everything in the results section and then uh, um, duplicated in the, in the tables and things and i'm sorry there's a spelling mistake there as well 
comma, data analysis issues, failure to deal with confounding variables. You, you haven't, there, there may be variables which will have confounded the results of your study, but you haven't actually discussed them. Claiming to find something without directly supporting statistical test. So unless you can say, I found it, and this is the test that we used, don't quote it. And inappropriate conclusions for non-significant results or associations or differences. And this is something that, that we do find too often. As I said, it's, it's people saying, well, it was nearly significant or approach significance. If it's not significant, it's not significant. Common problems of discussions. Can I ask a question about significance? <laughs> you can indeed. Uh, so, you know, significance depends on what your cutoff is, right? And so I'm just curious, you know, is, is, a, is a, at the 0.05 level sort of standard, and if it's not significant beyond that, um, it's, you shouldn't report it, or, you know, like some economic journals, like 0.10 is okay, and so what's your sort of feeling about that? I th well, I mean, there's two, two things. One is that um, I always ask people to quote significant levels, that the, the P is less than either 0 0.05 or 0 0.01 or 0 0.01 or whatever. Sometimes people say significance P equals, well, P can never equals because it's about probability it's not about exact figures so there's that 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 figure i think that that <coughs> there are tests which you can use to say what is the appropriate significant level and it will it will vary i think with probably your population or the size of the problem but i think um probably a significant level of less of, of more than 0.05 is generally um less powerful should we say I mean, if you have significant levels of 0.1, then people are less likely to accept that. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I would usually hope to, to, to look at, you know, what, what I hope is that people will state in their, in their method section what their level of significance they're hoping to find and whether they, whether they come in within, within this limit. I think that's quite important. But... Um. That was my question. We also, Lahisha, I don't know if I'm saying your name right, she had, had several questions and she's been trying to get on, but for some reason we can't unmute her. So I'm going to read her questions to you and they, they, they kind of come from different places in the, um, in the presentation, so I apologize. Um, she asked, what are trendy titles? Um, she asked about re replication of topics that um, were were only done in other countries, but not in their setting. So would that be something that would be of interest? And um, how long a period is one allocated for corrections once once you get it, um, a revise and resubmit back from an editor? Right, so can you take those questions one by one, Kim? I... Yeah, <laughs> sorry, let me open it up again. Um, so the first question she said, what are 20 titles? So I, I think that goes back to the, um, a few slides ago. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, people sometimes think that if they have a, a, a cute title about that, that refers to a current issue like a pop song or something, that may make the paper more attractive. Uh, what, what I'm saying is that just keep your title very much to what you've done. Don't, don't try to make it um, more attractive by being something which is very relevant to now or very relevant to a culture, but is not very relevant generally. Um, I think she wants to hear you say an embarrassing, trendy title. <laughs> <laughs> I know um, I do. I know I do. Let yeah. me see. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my, uh, if I said anything trendy, my 11-year-old would think it was embarrassing. So we'll just go with that. that that's the point. That's the point. Okay. That, that, that what, we see, what we see is relevant now. Uh -huh. you know, you're, you're quite right. Your 11 year old has a very different culture than you have. Exactly. Uh, our papers have a very different culture in 10 years time than they had when we wrote them. Um, I, I, uh, I, th I think, I can't think of anything offhand, but, but, but <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> current and precise. If I think of something, I'll come back to you. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> So second question. You, I don't know if this is true in the rest of the world, but like uh, we have a term like on fleek. 
Have you have you heard of that, Lahisha? No, never so. heard it. Yeah. So I said something was on fleek, and my son made fun of me, and it means like it's on point. On point. It's it's accurate. Yeah. So you wouldn't want to use something like that that now isn't even popular. Like a couple months later. Well, I think that's, okay. that's exactly the point that 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 language changes. I mean, I, there was something I heard the other day, and I can't remember what the word was about kids being or people being very. Uh, up front and in the world and all the rest of it. And, and I'd, I'd never heard the term before. Oh, it turned out snowflakes. You know what snowflakes yeah. are? Well, you know, they're, 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 it's a generational thing which will pass and they'll come to a time where we don't know what they're, they're talking about. So just tr try to keep it precise and, and scientific. <laughs> Sorry, what's the next question, okay. Kim? Well, she's unmuted, so she can now ask them herself. Yay. Am I on? Yes, yep. we can hear you. Yeah. Hi, good okay. Evening. Thank you. Thank you. And the name is Lahija or Lahia. Um, the, 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 que the other question I had was about the top, the topics like replication of topics. Because if you, if you, if you go back to literature, you find something that has been done, but now in like my country or my setting, then it has not ever been done. So would that be ideally also a replication or it is just in a different setting? And are we allowed to do that? Is it no, adding I, something? No, I think you're adding something and that is the point. That, that <laughs> if, if, if there was a subject done in North America, in Chicago, and then someone replicated it in Chicago and found the same results, that's not interesting. If they did it in Chicago and then you did it in Namibia and found the same thing, that is interesting. So I think, I think those, those are big cultural things that I think that we need to, to know about. In the same way that if a study has only been done in, in women, is it the same apply to men? Um, I, th I think there, 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 is, there is stuff that, that needs to be repeated if yeah. it's in, with a different context. Okay, that's very good. And, and the next one, the next question was about, for example, if I sent in, um, an, an abstract or an, and you send it back how long do we have for corrections before we then send it back to you again um we usually allow um six weeks to two months so. i mean uh, we usually said a date by when we'd like it back but it's usually it's usually within perhaps two months okay Sometimes it may be a month, but but um, it, it is in a reasonable time because I know I know for myself as a scientist that I I have papers that I have um, got to, to to revise and send back, and and I need to prioritise them otherwise they won't get published. Okay. <laughs> um, there was one point I didn't understand or also hear clearly from from one of the slides on the uh, reference style. Would we find it then when we go back which one you prefer us to have to use? It, it's it's not what I put well, it's it's what each journal uses a different style. Mm -hmm. So if I submit a journal a, sorry, a paper to the journal addiction, I have to use the Vancouver style. Okay. If you submit a paper to my journal, you have to use the AA style. Um so you what you'll find that journals won't mix have one paper in one style, one style paper in the other style. Uh, and, and it's it's purely a, an editorial decision, I suppose, about which style they prefer. I mean, I, I prefer to see the names in the text and I, it gives me some idea of who they are. Because okay. if you know a field, you, you, can, you can grasp that. But it, it's, it is purely um, according to the journal. So if I submitted the paper to a diction mm -hmm. in the Vancouver style, and they rejected it, and I wanted to submit it elsewhere. I have to change the style, and it just means going through the paper and changing that style. Okay, thank you. Okay, any I other? I... Do I have? Go on. Any other questions? Uh, no, no. For now, we can go on. I think I asked all of them that I that I'd written. <laughs> I'm glad you asked them because I think it's important. And I was I was getting a bit worried that there were no questions apart from Kim. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, I had problems unmuting. Yeah. Problems. Okay, we, we may continue. I'm okay. Okay, thank you very much, Lahita. Okay, problems with discussions. <clears throat> Opening paragraph is only the summary of the results. Select the main data and emphasize two 
or three important conclusions in relation in relation to the data. <clears throat> Does not focus on the aims as stated in the introduction. Remember, the whole point about a paper is that, that you said what you're going to do, and then when you get to the discussion, you have to then say, this is what we found. Doesn't place the findings in the context of previous knowledge. Your, your paper should compare and contrast your data with relevant previous findings indicating what's new and what's confirmatory. <clears throat> so that goes back to your point, Kim, that some of the stuff is confirmatory. This confirms what we found in this paper, um, but this is new. Addresses too many issues and is too long. I mean, one of the things that, that I find, and, and this is one of the reasons that we look at uh, having a page, a, a word limit, is that some people can go on and on and on. We, and, and as a reader, I, I don't like papers that are too long because I, you know, you get, you get lost and bored in them. So if you've got too many issues and it's too long, then it's probably too much. Um, doesn't consider alternative interpretations or acknowledge major limitations of the work. One of the things that um, quite often happens is you can provide a alternative interpretation of, um, of what has happened, uh, of why these results have happened. And that's worth acknowledging because that also then can point the way to future research. <clears throat> Descends into politics and polemics. I mean, one of the things that, that uh, is interesting is that the politics and polemics of the addiction field are important in the sense that um, 30 years ago, harm reduction was a very hot topic and um, papers were written about that but the, you know that things have moved on and it's not it's not such an important topic um, if you want to write a paper that is about policy then do that but don't confuse it with a paper that's about research and it wastes a space discussing trends it goes back to what i said if you haven't found significant results you haven't found significant results responding to referees reports one of the things that happens is you get a, um, an email and it will say what the referees have thought. And quite often you may feel quite cross when you get that. Well, that's not fair. That's, that's irrelevant. And one of the things we, I always say to people is put it away and look at it again tomorrow. Because it's very easy to make a, a snap judgment on something and say, you know, that's not fair. Construct a detailed reply to referees. Reply with the numbered sections responding to the referees' points. And it makes a huge difference to, to editors that when I get a revision in, I like to be able to see what the referees' points was and what you've done about it. Make revisions to deal with major criticisms and explain why you have not dealt with the rest. <coughs> Sometimes you can't deal with them because uh, that may not have been part of the paper, part of the research. Um, don't forget you get a wide range of reviewers which, who may not be as familiar with the, the, this topic as you are. Describe each change you make. Refer the reader to the relevant page in the revised manuscript. Highlight changes in the text in a different colour. And this is really helpful. If you put your changes in, in say, red or yellow, it's very much easier for the editor to go through and see that you made those changes. If there are important or major changes recommended that you absolutely are sure are wrong, present a polite, logically argued rebuttal. Now, sometimes you may disagree entirely with the reviewer, <coughs> and it may be that you want, because maybe you know more about it than the reviewer does. Um, don't be rude about it though. Just just present the the, the argument why why you are. Uh, why this is this is the case <clears throat> and i'm always welcome i always welcome those sort of papers or those sort of responses i will certainly take note of them and will we'll respond to them engender trust never claim to make change you've not done so and you'd be astonished that i get papers where people come back to me and say we made the changes and you reread it and you think either they've submitted the wrong version or they haven't made any changes um, I need a, a copy of the paper where the changes are made. <coughs> if you've made major changes by rewriting whole sections of the paper, state that you've done so. Sometimes you need to rewrite, rewrite things rather than just minor changes. Just certain, deleted a few words, make clear the words by 
track changes or the color changes so that the referees can see something has been done. If you're asked to shorten something, do so at least by some extent or state by how much. And this goes also goes back to the thing about word length, that if I have a paper, you now I get a paper of 5,000 words on an interesting topic, and I'll write back and say, please bring this down to 3,000 or 3,500 words, and we will be happy to look at it for review. Keep your reply as short as possible. For example, one to three single space pages. If the referee writes three lines and you need a page to rebut it, your argument will not be convincing. If the referee cannot understand your point, try to see how the understanding has arisen and make changes so it will not happen again. If one person does not follow what you've written, the same may apply to other people. And this is this is this goes back to what we said about getting someone else to read your paper before you submit it. Because if someone says to you, well, that doesn't make sense to me, then you can be sure that someone else will say. Uh, answer questions raised by the referee in the manuscript, not in the cover letter. Spend a significant amount of time getting your reply as perfect as you can. Uh, it's much better that you spend time. And if you find that you're running out of time, it goes back to, to Lahid's comment about um, how much time. If you need another two weeks, then write to the editor and say, can I have another two weeks? And they usually say yes. <clears throat> Maximise the stress agreements with what they write. Acknowledge their contribution. Um, I mean, one of the things that, that we frequently have is that the authors say, I thank the referee because they've added to the strengths of the paper. Minimise disagreements, but not to the point of dishonesty. If you feel a referee shows a bias to a theoretical approach that differs from yours, you can explain that there are different approaches that yours equally valid. There is a different, genuine difference in opinion. You have a different, but scientifically legitimate view. Don't do this unless you have a strong case. And, and this, this is really important in science. Sometimes you may be working in a, an area which is, um, quite new. So I'll give you an example that, that my doctoral thesis, and this I say was 20 years ago, was about needle fixation, about compulsive injecting. And when I started doing it, there was only one paper published by someone in the mid seventies. So when I wrote my first paper on it, one of the reviewers said, oh, this doesn't exist. It's just people that, that, that um, want to get more drugs, want to inject. And, you know, there was a strong reason why the, this review was wrong. We had to rebut that. But I did it from a scientific point of view. And, and I think we actually won the case on that. So if you think you, you may be the person that is the one that's done more research on this than anyone, and the reviewer may have a point, uh, another point of view. Another example was that when we did this trial on prescribing dexamphetamine for amphetamine use, it was unethical because it was different from the um the the addiction basis of opioids um and therefore it shouldn't happen but in fact we we got very good results from it and therefore we had a strong case of of, of harm reduction and crime reduction if you think that your approach is right then don't be afraid to argue your point ah thank you and good luck that's the end of it um one other point i was going to which links slightly to your point Nahija, but about um relevance of, of topics um mm -hmm. there is there is sometimes a temptation for people to think this subject only occurs in your country and that is not often so so for example when i was in the middle east there were people asking me about water pipes now water pipes or um shishas um very common mm -hmm. yeah and they're, they're, they're spreading you see them in britain you see them in the u.s and in fact, they are 10 times more dangerous in terms of the chemicals and things that smokers get induced. Um, and therefore they are important. But, but people were saying, oh, this is only a subject for the Middle East. And, and I think that actually so many things are global. And it's the same way that the, the problems that are coming out of, of Sub-Saharan Africa in the Middle East because of the diaspora of people, because of global warming, because of, of migration, a lot of these problems are relevant. So, so when people say it's not relevant, I can question that. Thank you. Sorry, I feel I've been talking forever. 
Uh, sir, I have a, also have a question. This is Subur. Hello, Subur. Uh, hi. Yeah, my question is that, uh, uh, let's give me, give you in a life example. I submitted a paper to one of the journal and the paper was rejected based on one reviewer uh, comments. And it was in the, in the reason for the rejection was the, they said that there was difference between female and male. Because in our simple, we had like 50 a female in 300 male, and this was children. And another thing was that the using of term, we use the gender and they said it is sex or gender. And however, it was like something we can, we can revise the paper based on uh, the second comment, like the gender in sex, but the the sample size we had, it was like we were not agree with the comment of the reviewer, and the paper got rejected. Uh, the thing is, can we can I apply for appeal or not? You can apply for appeal. Um, they may not. They, I mean, it's, it's always worth doing that as long as you argue well why you should do it. Um, and I, th I think there there are problems with sometimes with terminology. Sex and gender is in in places like the UK and the US is probably a big hot topic, and and people would argue about whether gender and sex are the same thing. In terms of scientific research, when we're looking at the difference between boys and girls, I think it is a, can be nitpicky about that. So it's worth appealing on that. In terms of the sample size. Um, it, it is. If you think the sample was adequate, then you could you could argue that point. If they still don't accept that, then submit to another journal. Okay. You know, I think one of the, one of the things that you have to remember is that that when I select, I don't know them personally because I use probably fifteen hundred or more reviewers a year. I don't know them all personally. And some of them may not be, may have very different views to me. Um, I have to go on what they say. Well, I, well, I, some, sometimes I disagree with them, so uh, I would disagree with them. But um, it is worth submitting elsewhere because you may get a, a completely different response. And one thing as a follow-up question, like uh, it's common for the journal or for the editor to like, uh, reject the paper based on one reviewer comment or usually it goes to two or more than two reviewers? It's, I always try to get two reviewers. Um, I have a problem that if, if I have had a paper that's had eight reviewers decline it, um, I may go with one reviewer or I may review it with one of the editorial staff because what I don't want is for you as an, as an author to wait for some months, months of our views. So it will always be reviewed, um, but it may be that I'll go with one review, if the review is strong enough. If the review is poor, and this is true whether I have one or two reviews, sometimes I get reviews back which are two lines and they just say, this is, this is fine, accept it. That's not good enough for as a review, and I would, would expect much better than that. So it depends on the quality of the review. Um, if it's if it was just one reviewer and you were unhappy with that reviewer, then it's worth either um, appealing to the editor or it elsewhere. Thank you very much. Any other comments? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm having a, a question as well to ask. This one. Um, yeah, when you were talking about the other time about um, results and uh, you said yeah it could be significant or not what about in the case where you have partial significance how do we you know do that can we still require to report that or we can you hear me uh, I, sorry can you hear so me partial, what do you mean by partial significance Yes, in uh, sometimes in multiple regression analyses, uh, you can have results not fully or not jointly predicting your outcomes. Yeah, there could be partial 
pre uh, you know predicting influence on the dependent variable so i'm i'm wondering if we can go ahead to report that result like that i think i, I think you need to discuss them in in the results section if there is a um what you call a partial significance. Can you hear? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. If you have a, if you have a, if you have a partial significance, <coughs> as you're talking about, I think you should discuss that in the results section, and discuss the, uh, and then discuss what you think the relevance of that is. Okay. So, so I okay, think, thanks. yeah, I think I think that's a very good question, and I think it, it, it um, don't, don't lose what you've had. Okay. I think the major problem is when we have people who are saying we're reporting a lot of significant results. Thank you. Are there any other questions, points? I'm good. Perhaps we should um, schedule the next, find a time that works for people to schedule the next um, discussion and also maybe have somebody volunteer to share a, a work in progress for the next discussion. Are we, are we setting a date? Do we have a date for the next one? That's what I'm asking. What what date is is this a good? I mean, obviously people are here. Um, is this a good day of the week and time of the day? It, it's good for me, and, and I, I will I will prioritize it. Um, but that depends on on others. Yeah, for me it's also like it, I I just have to schedule it based on my patients. It's okay. I'll, I'll prioritize also. And, rem and remembering the time difference. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, also for me, I think for now, I uh, am finding it easier uh, to connect this time yeah. with the class, yes, for now. You know. Good. I think the difficulty is for the Americans getting up so early. <laughs> it's just us that have to get up early, but that's okay. We, we designed this not for us. Um, so, I, so everybody else is on mute. Um, what, so if we looked at two weeks from now, it would be February 5th. February 5th. That's fine for me. Why don't we come in then? I'm not hearing any opposition. Uh, no, that's good for me, February 5th. Okay. February, 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 February. Let me check. Check my calendar. Yeah. <laughs> no. Solomon and Samuel, you have gone off mute. I Does think that time work for you? Yeah. February 5th? Yeah, it's a good day. The same time. Yeah, it's a good day. That's for me. Okay. <laughs> so let's plan on February 5th at the same time, um, wherever, you, whatever the time is where you are. Uh, <laughs> and um, does someone have a paper that, that, so I, the idea of this is that it's a, it's a, a writing group and so if someone has a work in progress that you that you would um, like share with people to read before the um next before february 5th and to discuss um that would probably be the way so we so richard would do some presentation um on something that came out of either your request or um his reading of your paper and then um and then we I think I can do that. You have one that you that Lahisha. Yeah, yeah. So I can. I, I think. Are we all on the email for me to email everybody? 
Mm -hmm. um, we yeah. can create, Carrie. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm going to send an email out after it's probably some point today with the PowerPoints okay. and okay. Um, okay. then you'll okay. have everyone's or if it's easier for you, you can send it to me and I can send it to the group either way. Okay. Mm -hmm. fine. That's either way, it's okay. Okay. Sounds good. Great. And I'll, I'll include, there may be a few people who aren't on the call for whatever reason, but they're still in this group. So okay. you might see a couple extra emails because... It's been difficult for some people to get on the call this morning or today. Okay. Um, Richard, is there anything else you want to say in terms of planning or? No, no, I think this, is, this has been a very interesting for me. This is the first time I've done something like this. I was a bit anxious mm. about the, uh, the technology. I hope it's worked. Um, so for next time, I can think about something um, briefly to to, to um, present, but also there are two things. One is the discussion of papers, and the other is I will be reviewing papers when they are for for prior to, prior to submissions. Yeah. So um, that's all part of the service that we're offering. Yeah. All right. Well, then I'm going to end the recording.